Thank you all. Welcome back to a, another COVID-19 weekly update briefing from FuseNet. Looking forward to our outline for today's presentation, we'll start with the key messages, move into the state of known COVID-19 cases around the world. We'll discuss uh, briefly an update on price trends that we're seeing, how households are accessing income and food to meet their food needs. We'll also cover major drivers that we're seeing in addition to COVID-19 that are coming on top of this global shock that we're seeing in 2020. And with recent updates to particularly the economy in Yemen, um, our country of focus today will be Yemen. Starting with the key messages, as we always do, as of Sunday, there were 165,705 known cases of COVID-19 and nearly 5,000 associated deaths reported across the 29 countries where FuseNet has presence offices or does uh, remote monitoring reports. The average daily cases in June is more than 3,500. This is compared to just 1,750 last month in May and 340 in April. So a sharp increase uh, continuing the number of reported cases across FuseNet reporting in remote monitored countries. COVID-related uh, movement restrictions have slowed regional and international market uh, trade as well as internal trade activities uh, in many countries and movement restrictions and bans have not yet led to stockouts for key staple foods though, um, which has supported uh, only minor price in increases or moderate price increases that we've seen to date. Uh, this is true, however, uh, for, for staple food commodities, but not for perishable goods, which we're seeing more erratic uh, distribution of prices and demand and supply in, in, in monitored markets. The uh, global staple food supply is supported by good, uh, favor good food availability at the global level. Um, which is supporting um, the market fundamentals that we've seen lead to generally stable food prices, aside from where we're seeing these intermittent COVID-related shocks. Access to income and food remains constrained as measures taken to slow the spread of COVID-19 continue to impact both urban and rural livelihoods. Uh, we have data from recent national surveys that confirms reports that we've been seeing in recent months that COVID is in fact having a significant impact on poor populations in these urban and rural areas both in terms of employment and income and household, how households gain access to food. COVID-19 shocks to food security in 2020, however, come on top of many other important drivers that we'll discuss a bit later in 2020, notably conflict in West Africa and Central, Central Africa, as well as South Sudan and Yemen, macroeconomic drivers, particularly in Zimbabwe and Sudan, and the locust outbreak in East Africa that is expected to be followed by poor rainfall later this year in 2020 over the Horn of Africa. As we've noted in recent briefings, FuseNet estimates that uh, 90 to 100 million people will be in need of humanitarian food assistance in 2020 across the 29 countries monitored and reported on by FuseNet. We also have a global needs estimate for additional 17 countries and that number is unchanged. We expect that the global need in the 46 countries that we provided that update for uh, will remain 100, about 109, excuse me, 113 million people for 2020. So again, to start with the state of known COVID-19 cases, as we typically do, this chart illustrates the uh, daily number of COVID-19 reported cases in orange bar. The seven, or excuse me, the green line is the seven day moving average uh, for COVID-19 case reporting and the blue line is the number of deaths. And as we have seen over the last couple of months, we continue to see an increase in both the number of cases and the number of deaths in FuseNet monitored countries, as you see here on the left. We did want to, however, call your attention to the fact that in many countries where we hadn't seen a large reporting of cases, we are starting to see an even larger increase in the number of cases that are being reported. The chart here on the right presents the same data, the daily COVID-19 cases, the seven day moving average and total deaths, but in this case for Mauritania. And as, how you can, as you can see here, beginning in late May, early June in Mauritania is when we started to see the sharp increase in the number of cases uh, being reported, which came much later than we saw at uh, the more global level when you look at the chart on the left. Um, elsewhere in, so in Mauritania, this, this increase that we've seen over the last week has in, uh, contributed to a 50 
percent increase in the number of cases in Mauritania. Elsewhere in West Africa and Benin, there was a doubling of cases over the last week. And in Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, and Nigeria, there was about a 25% increase in the number of cases over the last week. So while at the global level, we continue to see a continued increase in not only the number of cases, um, but also the number of fatalities, the rate of increase is picking up in um, countries that we previously had not um, seen as high of a caseload before. Um, as we've discussed in recent weeks, this is not necessarily only due to increase in the spread of the virus in these countries, but also in many instances uh, contributed uh, to by the fact that the level of uh, testing and reporting in many of these countries had previously been very low, and we'll particularly touch on that for Yemen as an example um, towards the end of the briefing. This map here is the global update from the World Health Organization on the number of cases reported in the last week for the period of uh, June 22nd to the 28th that you can find in their daily situation report updates. The uh, increase in the spread of the virus is uh, obviously what is contributing to some of the changes and measures that uh, countries across the globe are taking in response to uh, COVID-19. It's these increases along with the concerns voiced by the populace, however, that are also contributing to the pol policy decisions that are being made. This map here comes from ACAPS on the reporting of government measures that are being taken, either phased in or phased out across uh, available country data that they have in their database. Uh, this is as of yesterday and the colors, or excuse me, the countries indicated in yellow here indicate countries where governments have been phasing out COVID-19 related lockdown, movement restriction, and or social distancing measures um, just in the month of June. And some of these measures being phased out range from the increase in number of uh, passengers that can ride in private cars in Uganda uh, to the phasing out of uh, movement restrictions, um, restrictions on social, ga social gatherings and businesses in the Somaliland Authority, which is noted here as a sub-national um, indicator on this map, however. So a wide range of both measures that are um, being ramped up, but also that are being phased out across um, countries. And as we know, the control measures are um, known to slow or, or aim to slow the spread of the infection, allowing health systems to better address infection in advance. Uh, of a vaccine or in, in advance of, of more plans that the um, government health systems may have. However, at the same time, these control measures are in many instances inhibiting household access to their typical livelihoods and in some cases, typical market functioning. And due to both actual and perceived impact uh, impacts from the control measures, in many cases, um, individuals are choosing to ignore the control measures uh, that are put out by their governments and local authorities uh, across countries monitored by FuseNet as well as many other countries. Um, this is in some cases limiting the impact that these control measures would have on livelihoods, but also at the same time limiting the efficacy of these control measures on the uh, halt or slowdown of the spread of the disease. One of the control measures that uh, we're continuously monitoring are the border restrictions. Um, that are in place due to uh, government and intergovernmental uh, restrictions uh, across the FuseNet monitored countries. This map um, is a map uh, that you can find on the FuseNet website, but indicates border closures due to cargo border restrictions in blue, labor and cargo border restrictions in purple, labor or livestock border restrictions in green, and labor, cargo, and livestock border restrictions in red across the borders. And the background here is just the um, most likely food security outcomes for the June to September period uh, for FuseNet. As we indicated in the, in the key messages, the underlying market fundamentals uh, for staple food prices remain favorable. Global supply remains among the highest on record and production conditions across key monitored uh, and producing areas remain favorable. Um, there are some protective export restrictions and surplus producing countries like in um, Asia, as well as speculation and confusion that are some detrimental effects that we're seeing on global prices. Um, and we expect some of that volatility to continue over time. 
For other commodities, particularly precious metals and industrial materials, uh, we're seeing uh, continued volatility in some of those markets. Global downturn in the economy is contributing to a decline in the demand for industrial materials. Uh, precious metals, on the other hand, um, as you can see by this uh, chart from the World Bank, um, have continued a moderate uh, upward, upward trend as we move through 2020 for many precious metals. Um, the export of these global precious metal and industrial commodities are particularly important um, for FuseNet monitored countries like Nigeria, DRC, Guinea, uh, Angola, where we uh, see these economies highly reliant on their export earnings to sustain their, uh, their national economies. In Nigeria in particular, uh, we maintain continued concern over the depreciation of the Naira given the reduction in oil export earnings that um, we are seeing on, uh, in Nigeria and then the continued expectation for uh, fuel prices to remain low in the short to medium, medium term. Um, for staple food prices, we are seeing continued volatility in different markets with some moderate price increases uh, generally seen in, in East Africa. Uh, the price chart on the right shows prices uh, for the March to May period versus January in the solid blue bars. And then the hash bars are FuseNet's projections for September 2020 versus average. And as you can see, we are expecting in, in East Africa, for example, uh, some moderate price increases to continue for staple food prices. However, at the, the same time, some of these uh, staple food price increases are also met with uh, the expectation for continued increase in um, livestock sale uh, earnings, as you can see for, for goats here in Kenya and Ethiopia, which in some instances is expected to moderately at least offset the increased cost of uh, staple food price purchases. We are seeing continued disruption to household livelihoods and how they access food and income at the same time that we see some of these moderate price increases or price volatility to continue due to the COVID-19 uh, situation. In Guatemala, there's a recent report out um, where employers are already indicating for, for quarter three of 2020, for the next three months of 2020, that they are expecting the informal sector, so the, the informal sector um, demand for labor to decrease over the next three months. Um, that's a particularly interesting report considering that it's coming out from the private sector itself and not necessarily from uh, governments leading on this. Um, however, they are in the example of Central America expecting the ag sector uh, to continue a moderate increase in, in agricultural labor demand given that um, generally agricultural commodities aside from coffee as we noted last week uh, are continued to see favorable exports in, in the region. Um, in addition to these qualitative reports that we have been seeing over the last several months, over the last month or so, we've been seeing more quantitative data come out on the impacts that the COVID-19 restriction measures are having on household access to income and um, other economic opportunities that lead them to accessing food in, in the long term. Two examples that we have indicated on this slide here are for Ethiopia, uh, both from the World Bank, um, Ethiopia COVID-19 high frequency phone survey on the left and the Nigeria COVID-19 national longitudinal phone survey on the right. Reports for these two countries were released earlier this month um, with the raw data soon following on the World Bank data page um, from data collected in April and May. And um, if you have a chance to read through those reports or some of these um, uh, extracted figures you can see here, you can see um, in Ethiopia on the top left, for example, that there is a generalized reduction in um, household income across most sectors. Um, total income since the outbreak uh, by, by wealth group is decreasing. Um, and then job losses by, by sector in the bottom left and respondents who lost jobs due to the outbreak based on the, their type of employment on the bottom right for Ethiopia also showing um, decreases that can be generalized across populations in, in Ethiopia. On the right hand side, we can see uh, a similar story, story in Nigeria, which is uh, another highly populated country on the continent. 
uh, with some change in income sources uh, since March showing 50% or greater of respondents indicating a de decrease in, in their income sources. And then the impact of COVID-19 on working status by sector also showing um, many impacted by COVID-19 and having to stop, to stop work. Uh, again, after a few months into this global generalized crisis, while we did have um, many surveys that were being conducted remotely at the, the onset, we're seeing a, a greater availability of national data sets uh, that are coming out and reporting, um, which is um, at least to date largely corroborating many of the um, reports that we had previously been hearing from more qualitative um, sources. The ACAP, um, ACAPs who uh, did the monitoring that we presented earlier on the types of uh, restrictions that governments are putting in place to slow the spread of COVID-19 also is monitoring the humanitarian exemptions that exist across countries. Uh, this data was collected in uh, May from um, implementing partner and uh, donor surveys that were conducted to assess the degree to which reporting or excuse me, humanitarian agencies were reporting um, exceptions to the movement restrictions uh, that were in place. This is important uh, to note, not only continued, continued humanitarian operations for um, countries that are experiencing humanitarian need due to COVID-19, but also uh, because of continued need to many other crises uh, that uh, existed either before the onset of COVID-19 or also existing in, in, in parallel to the impacts we're seeing from COVID-19 in 2020. This includes a uh, generalizable uh, reduction in rainfall across Central America and the Caribbean over the last couple of years, which is uh, has been shifting uh, how households are accessing food given that there have been many poor seasons over the last five, six, seven years in that region. In West Africa, we're seeing continued high degrees of conflict in the Lumtako Gorma region, um, uh, in northern Burkina Faso, in western Niger, and in central Mali. There's continued conflict in both northeast Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, but also spreading into um, northern and northwestern Nigeria in, over the last uh, year plus. Uh, with recently 30,000 people displaced from northern Nigeria into neighboring Niger. Continued conflict uh, over the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon as well as in the Central African Republic. Um, we see continued economic crises, uh, particularly in Zimbabwe with the weakening, continued weakening of the macroeconomic situation there, but also in Sudan, um, in, in East Africa, continued conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as they're coming out of um, the Ebola crisis that they faced over the last several months. Um, as with Central America and the Caribbean, Southern Africa has also faced several poor seasons in a row over the last five, five to six years. And in East Africa, um, in addition to the locust outbreak that has been ongoing um, in East Africa and has the potential to spread into West Africa, particularly depending on the direction of the winds and the pattern of the rainfall um, and availability of, of forage for the locusts over the coming months. Uh, we are expecting with the ENSO and Indian Ocean Dipole uh, combination that we see uh, moving into late 2020 that there's going to be another uh, likely below average season, poor season in the Horn of Africa um, after that region has seen several uh, catastrophic uh, rainfall seasons in 2017 and 18. Um, there has also been ongoing flooding concerns in the region um, from the above average rainfall that compensated in um, the last two seasons in the region. And then uh, Yemen also remains a country of significantly high concern uh, for FuseNet. It remains the largest humanitarian crisis and has held that status for the last few years now. More than uh, 1,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in, in Yemen, with the highest number of cases reported in southern governance of Hadramaut, Aden, and Taiz. Um, however, information on the extent of testing is, is rather limited in Yemen. I think as we reported before, available information suggests that the testing rate per capita in Yemen is among the lowest in the world. 
Um, anecdotal evidence suggests that the true extent of the outbreak is much worse than what's being reflected by the official figures that are reported to the WHO as, as well as others. Um, there are news reports that the WHO is operating under the assumption that there is a full-blown transmission occurring of COVID-19 now in Yemen. Um, and then there's also anecdotal reports from other humanitarian actors about the reporting of um, treatment centers in taking severe cases of respiratory diseases um, that are that are likely to be COVID-19 despite the, the lack of testing capacity in many areas. There are continued movement restrictions and social distancing measures um, in place across Yemen. These appear to vary significantly uh, by locality. According to analysis from the Sana'a Center, the Houthis' primary source of revenue is from taxing all forms of economic activity, however, in the areas that the control and any COVID-19 control measures that impact businesses are expected to impact the revenues as well, um, which might uh, likely impact the decisions that are made in northern governance in particular on how to proceed with social distancing measures. Remittances are a very important key source of income in Yemen. Um, it's it's uh, a source of income that's amounted to about four billion, just less than four billion dollars uh, between 2016 and 19, as reported by the World Bank, um, with in uh, estimates that a significant portion of that that revenue comes through or those remittances come through uh saudi arabia and the uae and that's being impacted currently by the ongoing um restriction measures that are in place both in yemen but but uh, a particular concern in countries that are sending remittances to to yemen however the primary um, concern in Yemen continues to be the active, open, and on, ongoing conflict. Uh, the map here on the left is from, well, the, all the figures on this slide are from ACLED. The map on the left is indicating the number of, and type of conflict events uh, between April 10th and June 6th, uh, despite a recent peace agreement, ceasefire, excuse me, that was um, reached between the STC and the Hadi government, the Yemeni government fighting continues in the South, um, particularly large and strong battles in and around Abiyan. And the conflict continues to impact how households are accessing food and income on top of what we're already seeing from um, the initial impacts from COVID-19 restriction measures. But at the same time, um, we are seeing a severe weakening of the Yemeni uh, economy. The government continues to face difficulty in raising uh, revenues from oil exports uh, which is, is its main foreign exchange earner aside from um, top-ups that it's received to the central bank. This has ex likely been exacerbated. The, the reduction in oil uh, revenues has likely, be, likely been exacerbated in recent months, uh, given the low global oil prices. Um, in 2019, Yemen exported around 50 million barrels of oil, which um, was only approximately half of what they exported in 2014. As you can see here, this is having a strong knock-on effect on the economy. Uh, the chart on the left is looking at the value of the Yemeni rial um, compared to the U.S. dollar. And beginning in late uh, last year and moving into early this year, we saw a shift in the value of the rial, depending on the market that it was being um, exchanged on. And we're expecting a continued depreciation of the rial uh, through our uh, FuseNet scenario period into January of 2021. This is expected to increase uh, or have a knock-on effect of, of staple food prices um, with a strong increase in staple food prices expected across commodities, across markets in, in Yemen. Um, the current prices are indicated by the black dots on the right, five-year averages by the gray dots on the right, and our 2020 upper bound projections by the white um, bubbles on the right. This is particularly concerning given that um, when we saw a similar situation uh, about a year and a half ago in Yemen, we were uh, uh, expecting to see a, a significant reduction in the availability of food across the uh, country, uh, given the high reliance on food imports that, that Yemen faces and the importance that um, staple food purchases on international markets. Um, are at the same time that Yemen's uh, availability of foreign exchanges is, is continuing to decline. 
Um, we are continuing to monitor the, the food security situation very closely, particularly now given the reduction in um, the, the, the strong reduction in the economic situation in Yemen. However, at the same time, um, this is a, a broader humanitarian crisis, and we just want to stress that we are seeing high levels of conflict continue, as illustrated by the chart on the left showing the number of airstrikes per five-day period since early 2001. Um, that conflict is expected to, to continue to impact um, food security in other sectors across, across Yemen. Um, one of those sectors noted here being nutrition with high levels of acute malnutrition reported across the country in the SMART surveys reported um, in 2019. There are not any available SMART surveys yet in 2020. And we are expecting high levels of acute food insecurity to continue across Yemen um, throughout the FuseNet scenario period with uh, many areas facing emergency um, IPC phase four or IPC phase three only due to the, uh, to the presence of humanitarian food assistance, which is now reduced to about um, eight and a half million people per month down from 12 million people per month um, earlier in 2020. And we'll end with the map that we typically do. This is from our FuseNet alert. The most recent version of that alert is up on the FuseNet website as of yesterday, I believe. And again, we are expecting in the 29 FuseNet reporting countries across the globe, about 90 to 100 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, both from COVID-19 and other related factors in 2020. Thank you.